I wish we had a single shred of evidence. Because we were of Aboriginal appearance, the police said to my mum that she's probably going to walk about. What did you make of him? Mm -hmm. Just felt like to me that he was just a con man. And ten years on, you still don't know? No, no idea. I suppose it's really a, a big emotional roller coaster that you're on and you can't get off it. Welcome everyone, good to have you with us tonight. Uh, Sassoon, your younger brother, Savak, disappeared almost three years ago. He was 21 at the time. What did you think had happened at first? At first he failed to return home for work um, and we got a bit worried. Um, we, he left the house last on Monday night and we eventually found his car on the Friday. Did you know where he'd gone? No, we didn't. Um, we believed that he was going bushwalking um, based on something his friend had said, but we weren't uh, certain. Mm. Irene, you're the youngest brother. Um, you were one of the last people to see Savak on, on that Monday night. Did he say where he was going? Did you have a sense of where he, where he was headed? He was interested in the district where we found his car, Kanangra Boyd National Park. Okay, so this was a very bushy area. Yes. Yeah. Um, we were thinking he was going to um, Barrington Top North, but his friend, um, when he, he met his friend, his friend said he was, he was thinking go to Blue Mountain. Mm -hmm. And this was to go on a bushwalk by himself? Correct. Yeah, he was going, yeah, he was, yeah, yes. Mm. Um, how did he seem, Irene, when you saw him? Last time I saw him, he was a bit agitated, frazzled up. Um, he just didn't seem like his usual upbeat self. He was very quiet. Yeah, unusually was, so. Unusually, yeah, yeah, he was quiet, yeah. Mm. Then he went to the computer room and he was there for about uh, half an hour like that. Uh, then uh, about 7.30 at night, he just, uh, uh, he just, I, I, when I looked at the uh, door, he just closed the door and he just gone. And then um, I, um, I thought maybe he went to his friend's house. Masis, how did he seem to you as his dad that, that last time you saw him? Um, actually, uh, that day, which is, um, he loved his uh, dry fruit. Um, then one of our friends sent some fruit from Armenia. And um, he looked and uh, he took only, pick up only a couple. And usually when, before that, um, he was saying to me, Dad, can you ask Rosanna? sent a one ton of this because I love this. But this time, that was so strange for me, which is um, only pick up a couple. And then um, when he went uh, to computer room and when he came out and went around the house and um, so walked out from um, hallway and as he was, um, Closing the door, even he didn't look, he just straight went out. And was that unusual? That was very unusual. Mm. Now, his friend led you to where his car was? Yes, he, he led us, he led us. And uh, how did he know that? How did he know where the car was? Um, I don't know, still we don't know how he knew the car was, but I said, okay, how did you know Sevak's car was here? So he said, uh, just by experience, um, I thought it's here. Then next day, which is Saturday, police and um, volunteers and RFS and ACS, everyone, they started with helicopter and... Um, a big search and it's a big, big area. That was mm. big search for 18 days. Mm. Tell me about Savak. What's he like? He was very kind, nature lover, ambitious and uh, very creative, very nice boy. And uh, he didn't, uh, he was, he was himself, yeah. So soon, you still have no idea what's happened? No, I have no idea. I wish we had a single shred of evidence to suggest or to push us in a particular direction, but for now we have no evidence and I, I don't know what to think. If I, if I sit there and think about it all the time, it, you know, it will drive me crazy. So um, I'm trying to focus on what we do know 
and what we can control and, um, and basically accept the unknown. Mm. Kath, your daughter Chantelle and your granddaughter Leela disappeared 10 years ago? That's right. You last saw them 10 years ago. Yes. Where were they living? They're living in a little um, farmhouse just out of Nanup in Western Australia. And what were the circumstances they were living in? Um, they were just living as um, with a friend and then the father of uh, Leela. Chantelle was 27. That's right. She was living with a ma this man yes. on as Simon mm -hmm. and he was involved in a cult, yes. a small cult. Oh. Can you tell us about him? Yes, he thought he was a cult leader, but I don't think he sort of had many people interested in it, really. What did you make of him? Very weird. Um, you never got to know him very well because when I ever went over to see Chantel and Leela, he would stay in his room all day. So how did you feel about the relationship? Um, I was very apprehensive. Um, but they'd sort of been together for a fair while, but um, it was always sort of strange. And was she committed to those ideas, to those beliefs? A little bit, but I don't know if she was that way. We have a short clip that she sent you um, mm -hmm. of her and Leela, your granddaughter, with another man who's, who's in yes. the cult, who's there on the right, yes. and then Simon is there at the back. Namaste. Namaste. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're a bum <laughs> Leela looks like a very um, chirpy little girl. Yes. Mm. yes. Tell me about that last visit you had with your daughter and granddaughter ten years ago. What was it like? Um, I got there and it was really exciting to see them and um, we would go out in the days but the whole time I was there, probably after the first couple of days, I felt something strange was up. Um, I just had this gut feeling and it, I just tried to ask her questions without being too prying um, but they apparently got a, a passport for Leela and it had come in the mail while I was there but they didn't say anything about it. Um, Simon took it and put it away. Um, and then they had visitors one night because um, she asked me to have Leela with me at the little cabin when I was staying in in Nanup. And I said, she said, oh, I'm tired. I wanted to get an early night. So I had Leela. And when I saw her the next day, she said to me um, that she didn't get an early night they had visitors and that was unusual because they didn't have visitors very often. Mm. So you had a bad feeling. Could you I put did. your finger on what it was? No, I wished I'd asked perhaps more questions or try to find out more. But I thought, well, you know, she's an adult and I just, you know, got, she's got her life. So I mm. just let it go. What are they like? Tell me what your daughter oh, and granddaughter are like. They are full of life. Um, they're very creative. Um, Leela, the, she is very loud and in your face, as you can see from the video. Um, but she was, they were loving, they were kind um, and caring. And I just can't imagine that, you know, they, they're gone. And where are they? And they don't contact me because I used to keep in contact all the time. After that visit, your daughter rang you to say that she was leaving the country. Yes. Where did she say she was going? She said she was going to go to Brazil um, and help people. And I said, oh, what are you, she's going to live in a, like a commune uh, near the um, Amazon and they were going to help people. And that's sort of what they believed in. So I just thought, oh, well, you know, that's OK. I said, but please keep in contact. And... Um, I wanted her to, to, you know, contact me. We've got the internet on and everything, but we never heard. When did you start to worry? Uh, probably, well, it was a month or two had gone by and we kept trying to find out, you know, what's happened because we told her to write to us and we never heard anything and 
my brother told me to um, get in contact and report a missing through our local police, which we did. Mm. And what happened then once you'd done that? Once we'd done that, he'd done um, a bit of um, sort of research and that, and um, he come back to us and said that there was a note on the door and they said they'd gone to Brazil. Uh, there was furniture in the house, um, food in the fridge, and they'd gone. And um, their bank accounts weren't touched and she'd sold the car and there was nothing. So their bank accounts hadn't been touched? No. And was there a record of them going to Brazil? No. The immigration said there was nothing unless they went out um, by other means. So how were you feeling by then? Oh, frantic. <laughs> um, I was so worried and I was so sort of, I felt like I was blaming myself at first because I had that uneasy feeling when I was there and then they were gone and why didn't I, you know, do this and why didn't I ask more questions? But I just sort of kept trying to find out and, um, yeah, and that's all I could do. Your husband, Jim, is, is also here. Yes. Um, Jim, what, what was it like for you and how, how did you react when you realised that all this had happened? Oh, it's pretty hard to say. I suppose it's really a, a big emotional roller coaster that you're on and you can't get off it. So you just keep, keep trying to find ways you can try and find out. So I, I did the things like I contacted embassies and I contacted immigration and before we finally got onto the police and got them to do it all. So you just feel hopeless and useless sort of thing. So you really just try whatever you can. You know, we made posters and paint, posted them everywhere and did all sorts of things. You did a lot of that kind of thing yourselves? Yep. Yes. Yeah? Yes. We travelled around um, Australia and um, my boss uh, printed out all these um, flyers for us to put up and with the um, Crime Stoppers number on it and the descriptions and photographs and um, we went around Australia putting them everywhere because we were told that they hadn't left Australia, so hmm. we were hoping. So. And did you get anything back from that? We got a fair bit of help from the media actually, so they found out things like that Simon wasn't really Simon, that he was under an assumed name and illegal immigrant. This was the, the her partner. His partner, yeah. Uh, he was really Gary Felton. So we, the media sort of found out more than the police and told us. So that all took about four years, I guess, or maybe a bit longer. And what was that like as that unfolded, as you realised that he wasn't who he said he was? Oh, and... It was awful. It, you just felt. Who is this person? Um, what has he done that he's got to have an assumed name? And you know, your mind goes crazy thinking of all the things that could be happening and things like that. Mm. You just don't know then. And ten years on, you still don't know. No, no idea. We just hear all these things that you know he'd been involved with beforehand. And what sort of things um, have he been involved with beforehand? He's um, just conned people out of their money um, and plagiarised the, the stuff he'd written in the books and that was sort of nothing then. So mm -hmm. just felt like to me that he was just a con man. So soon there was a major search for your brother, Savak. When did it start? How soon did it start? So we found the car on the Friday and the search began on Saturday morning. And what was it like for you when that search was called off after 18 days? It was very difficult um, to grasp. We really thought we'd find answers through the search, at least some piece of evidence to suggest that he was there. Um, but after that it finished, we basically uh, focused our attention on other avenues. Um, we considered other possibilities and yeah, we, we weren't satisfied that nothing was found. Um, even though the terrain was quite rough and the place was quite remote, we still thought we'd find something. You wanted to keep going? If it, if it was up to me, yeah, of course I would want mm. to keep going. You went back to the search site recently. Let's have a look. We wake up every day thinking about where he could be. So this is where we found Savak's car. And we were calling his name, we were screaming out his name, like at the top of our lungs. And it was so disheartening when we didn't get a response because we were like, Savak! 
you know, just really loud and, and it was just echoing everywhere. If someone saw him here on the day, if something happened here on the day that we don't know about, or if someone saw him somewhere else. I just remember when we were here during the search, a few people said, just imagine if Sev just came walking out any second and just said, like, what's all this for? I'm all right. Yeah. The search itself was really difficult because of the roughness of the terrain, because of the density. It's just really, really hard to see anything. You could be a couple of metres from someone and not see them. They also used other equipment to try and detect sound. They used drones. Um, we had access to helicopters. I actually remember us sitting here and considering whether or not it's possible for someone to walk through there. It seems impossible, but we figured <laughs> my brother's capable of anything. There's just so much terrain. There's just so many places he could be. And even just sitting here right now, it's just we're so small. And there's just so much out there that possibilities are endless. That is such dense terrain, isn't it, to go bushwalking in. What do you think might have happened to him? At this stage, I'm considering everything. Um, because of the fact that we haven't found leads, um, I'm now open to the idea that something could have happened outside of the bush, um, whether it's foul play, whether he ran off for some reason, just considering everything. Do you think there might have been secrets that he had or something that you didn't know about? Well, if he's had secrets, they're going to be huge secrets because they have to explain a lot. Stephanie, your brother Rigby went missing two years ago when he was 53. When did you realise something was wrong? <sighs> Straight away. So the day that he went missing, he had called my mum and said he was on his way home and um, never got home. But I just had a really bad feeling. Did you contact the police straight away? No, we didn't. Mum wanted to contact the police straight away. Um, and I think at the time, yeah, I was put on a brave face and say, he'll be all right. And I, yeah, drove around and, on, you know, made lots of phone calls to the different hospitals and um, police stations just to see whether it may, may have been locked up or all his friends, I'd, well, you called them. And, yeah, then started getting really worrying because his friends hadn't seen him. So or when did friends. the police get involved? Initially, they, they didn't do anything. They kept sending me away and kept telling me that um, he was, you know, 53 years old and he was allowed to go missing. It wasn't for quite a number of weeks until, yeah, I got the media involved and, yeah, they, the police, the detectives that were working on it then found out a lot. Do you have any thoughts about what could have happened? Um, I know, well, now know that um, there was um, drug use involved and... Um, he was also um, meeting people on online um, dating sites. So I suppose one of the things I thought was that he had met with someone, you know, that um, taken advantage of him or... And he was a nice user? Did you know that before? I did. I didn't, I didn't realise the extent, I suppose, or I'd, maybe I didn't want to know. Rigby was, um, I suppose, a functional... Usually, he'd, um, and he didn't do it around the family, so it wasn't something um, that was in our face. Um, and he also had was on a lot of other medication. He had another um, condition that he was on um, painkillers and different things for. So, you hired private investigators we as did, well. Yeah. T tell us about that. They certainly got things moving with the police, and and they were a good support in directing us. They the um, uh, investigators were all uh, ex-police officers too, so they'd explain, look, this is what you need to be doing and this is what you need to be asking for. Some of his belongings were found? They were, yeah. Where were they found and what was found? Yeah, they were, well, they were actually were found on a person who his phone was tracked back to and that person then took the police out to this bushland and said, I found the belongings here. 
Your brother lived in a granny flat at the back of your mum, Kim's house. Your mum agreed to show that to us. Let's have a look. This is Rigby's kitchen and diner. This is just the way Rigby's made it. We don't come into here at all. We still don't know where Rigby is. And until we can accept Rigby not being here, we just don't want to touch Rigby's flat. We don't want to move anything that's there. I just can't make any sense of it, because Rigby was coming home. He did have computers and phones on here, but the police have taken them for just to see if they can trace Rigby at all. Rigby was on the meths, um, was talking about going to a clinic for a rehab. That was why we didn't straight away say, look, Rigby's missing. I thought first that perhaps he just walked somewhere or, I don't know, just perhaps collapsed somewhere, I don't know. So he's got his clothes but they're all just the same as what they were when Riggy left them. He's quite stylish, actually, Riggy. I've got eight children, and Rigby was number two. He was a magic little kid. And he just loved everybody. He was a very loving soul. Out here we've got Rigby's corner. I think about all my children. I've got terrific kids. What I hope for is that somewhere my kids will have their brother back. But I'd say that Rigby's never going to come back alive, but um, if they could find, just find Rigby and let, the, you know, let them have Rigby back, and that'd be fine. It'd be better, better still if he walked through the door. Stephanie, your mum is, you can see in her face what, what she's going through. How old is she? Um, she's 80. Mm, and what do you think it's been like for her? She, oh. She's talking about the kids, as mums do, and yeah. worrying about you. What do you think it's been like for her? Oh, it's hell for her. Kills me just to see her upset mm. and to be going through that when... You know, she should be enjoying her retirement and it's really hard. Birthdays and, and you know, Christmas, any celebration, celebration. as we was um, often centre of uh, a lot of, a lot of, you know, all of them. And it's just horrible um, trying to celebrate something with him not around. Do you feel any closer to knowing what might have happened to him? Not at all, no. No. We've spoken to the police. They say they haven't identified any evidence of criminality in this situation, mm. in his disappearance. Does yeah. that help at all? No. No. I mean, I'm probably very... Um, probably don't give the police as much credit as what I should, and that, and that comes back to not being um, helped initially. And we just want to find him. Like, it's about um, just getting him home and back to us so we can lay him to rest and give him that, um, or give the whole family that farewell that he deserves. What do you think has happened? I think he just got lost in the bush. That's why I think. Irene, what about you? I think um, he's run away from home. Uh, he will come back. Yes. Oh no. I'd advise the Australians to vote for it. Australia, don't vote for it. It's again gone. How has Ireland changed since voting for same-sex marriage? Dateline, tonight 9.30 on SBS and On Demand. Can eye contact alone reunite a mother with her estranged son? He wished to move in with his girlfriend. Just need some space. The bold new experiment, Look Me in the Eye, tomorrow 8.30 on SBS and On Demand. Being a kid is about dreaming big. Which is why MTA goes the extra mile to find and create world-leading teaching resources that inspire classrooms and help educators and parents go the extra mile 
to unlock the potential of little dreamers everywhere. We've hit the road and landed on the New South Wales mid-north coast to see what's happening with this season's blueberries. So, Harry, the weather's been cooler than expected. Mm. So crops have come in a bit late, but supply and quality are really stepping up. Oh, yes, Prices will be great. Yeah. I hear expecting 50% more fruit than last year. The quality's superb, and they get them to Woolworths straight away. They're beautiful. More picking, less eating, please. See you next week on the Woolworths Fresh Market Update road trip. Last year, Australia's official lotteries contributed over $1.1 billion to help support our communities, liking sporting groups. When Australia dreams, we all win. I used to drive to work, but these days I normally just walk. Yeah, I normally bring lunch to work. I normally drink a few of these throughout the day. When the kids play, I normally try to play with them. You've lost a few kilos, and that can reduce the toxic fat from around your organs. It lowers your risk of type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Everything looks normal. Get amazing deals during Hyundai's iSale, including a $1,000 gift card on selected models. The Hyundai iSale starts this Thursday. We provide payment options to allow you to use your cash elsewhere. It allows our customers to get what they need and not have to worry about it and then and there. Take advantage of 50 months interest free available store wide now at Harvey Norman. That's no deposit, no interest with 50 equal monthly payments until November 2021. Get set for the warmer weather with the latest in indoor and outdoor furniture, bedding, bedroom furniture, rugs and more. Update and upsize home appliances, computer technology and home entertainment. Shop for the latest deals in store and online now. But hurry, offer is limited. A massive 50 months interest free available store wide now at Harvey Norman. It doesn't see colour. It doesn't hear language. It doesn't care about religious beliefs, sexual orientation, or cultural differences. The ocean doesn't discriminate. And neither do we. Surf Life Saving Australia is for all Australians. Join your local club today. Masi Sassoon said earlier that he's open to all sorts of possibilities about what's happened to Savak. What do you think has happened? I mean, still, we hope he's running away, run away from something, but and I don't know where and, and why. Every day and morning, um, when I wake up, I look at my window and say, oh, he's going to come, he's going to come. And... Um, and um, when I sleep, my telephone is 24 hours, it's, it's charged, and every second I'm just, anyone uh, rings and quickly answer. I said, maybe that's him. What about you, Razik? What do you think has happened? I think because he was a bu uh, bush walker and he loved the bush, he loved the nature, I think he just went for a bush walk and he got lost. I don't think anything, anybody harmed him or he ran away. That's, that's I think, but my husband and my sons. Mm. So I you don't my... expect that he's going to come back? I think he just got lost in the bush. That's why I think. Mm. Irene, what about you? What do you think has happened? I think um, he's run away from home um, for one reason or another. It's unexplained, um, but he will come back in a number of years. So you feel confident about that? You, you... I'm pretty confident, yeah. Mm. And why do you think that so strongly? Um, I guess it's just something that he would do, whether it's something was troubling him or uh, something big enough would pull him towards that big act. I don't think he got lost in the bush at all. One of the volunteer SES crew uh, members during uh, that uh, entire search was startled because in 25 years, this volunteer SES uh, member stated that uh, he had not seen a case where there wasn't a single uh, piece of clothing found or a clear track or just anything of that nature. So, 
begs into question uh, that perhaps Savak did run away and that he wasn't in that bush at all. It doesn't seem as if something tragic has happened, something big, you know, for that matter. Um, so you're yeah. expecting him to come back at some point? Yes, yes. Mm. So soon, what, what's it like? I mean, what do you think of these different theories in the family? And what's it like with people having different ideas within the family about what's happened? I think everyone's going to give their own meaning to the situation and they're entitled to that. Um, again, I've got, I'm going off evidence. Um, I hope he's alive. I hope he's out there. But I can't imagine him putting us through this. I can't imagine him sending everyone on a, on a wild goose chase for, you know, for nothing. Um, I'm not sure if he'll return. I hope he does. Um, I just hope he's okay. Rosic, what's it like as a family having these different views? How do, does it affect the family? Yeah, we just keep asking the same question over and over again. Yeah, and it's very hard to know that. Masis, you mentioned how it's affecting you in terms of your daily life. What other things has it affected, little things, in the way that you live your life now compared to before? When I come home, I just, uh, at front of my house, at least I wait at least 10 minutes before I open my door. I don't want to go home. Because he's not there? Because he's not there. house is... The house is cold. It's, no one is there. To me, it's, it's just... It's, um, to me, it's very cold. The house is cold and freezing. It's without him. I don't want to go home. So every, every day it's happened to me. Was it you, Stephanie, who said you didn't feel you could celebrate? Rezik, you, you feel that too, yeah? yes? That's right. We can't celebrate. We don't have happiness. Um, I don't like to do much. Uh, I don't like to socialise as much as before. And, and I you just said you don't like on. to dress up even, I don't, to go yeah, out. Or... I don't like to go out. I don't like to dress up. Or I going to wedding I or party. Yeah, just yeah. She escaped from everything. We don't yeah. have life anymore. Mm. You don't feel no, you can be happy? No, I can't. Mm. Happy anymore. Mm. And Mrs. you don't make kebabs anymore. Oh. <laughs> no. no. Mm. It's um, Sebak. He, he would love my kebab every time. He said that when we are making kebab, and I was often making kebab, and he was sitting and enjoy. Since then, I would never make kebab because I said he's not there and. Only once, there was a couple of weeks ago, month, a couple of weeks ago, I made some kebab. I said, oh, Sevak, oh, I, I wish you could smell dad's kebab. Come home. This is our making for you. Come home. Mm -hmm. um, Sassoon, how has your life changed in a day-to-day -day sense, do you think, since this happened? It affects the big decisions I make. Um, you know, my future career, um, I actually dropped out of university a year into my master's because it was just getting too much. I feel like I was neglecting myself. Yeah, it's just not the way to do it. My priority right now is the health of my parents, the well-being of my family, and I just hope things can get better. It breaks my heart that my mum says she can't be happy again. Um, I know I can't be happy right now, but I'm hoping in the future we can work towards some level of certainty, some level of happiness. Um, I still believe that and I hope, I hope they can eventually come to terms with that too. Irene, what about you? Has it affected you? I was kind of able to take on uh, my middle brother's uh, Savak's like live and let live attitude of um, just living in the present moment. So, Are there things that have changed in your life, Kath? as a result of this, in, just in, a, in that day-to-day -day sense, in oh. that practical sense? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, like, every time there's another body found, I keep thinking, maybe it's Chantel, maybe we'll find something out. And, I mean, it's happened so many times now, it is just so hard. Mm. Do others mm. feel that way when they hear about other, other situations? Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I look forward to that day when somebody's found... Um, and you hear a lot more of because you're focused on it and it consumes you. 
Stephanie, your brothers wanted to have a memorial. How did you react to that? Um, well, I pretty much um, wasn't keen right now to do that and we just want to keep looking for them. You know, there's nothing to bury and no place we can go to to grieve or, yeah, it would be quite difficult. Rosique, you saw a memorial in the park where Savak disappeared that was for someone else recently. You, you spotted this memorial. How did you react when you saw that? Yeah, it was a bit strange to have uh, something like that in that uh, remote bush. How did the family react when you, when you mentioned it? Yeah, I think uh, I didn't say that we need to do the to same do one, thing. Yeah. The same thing, but uh, I think no, we can't do it because we need closure. We need to know what happened to him. Kath, last year some photos appeared on Facebook of an English speaking teenage girl who was dazed and lost in Rome, and there was speculation that that girl was your granddaughter. What was that like for you when that happened? First I felt, yeah, it could be, but I was pretty sure it wasn't because um, our granddaughter had a sort of a high forehead and this girl did not have a high forehead and I don't think that changes um, in time. But it did look a little bit like, um, since we've had a age progression photograph given to us by the missing uh, person or missing children's group in Canberra, they um, do look similar, but I'm fairly sure it's not her. And they did investigate and it wasn't, but yeah. Mm -hmm. it, what, what went through your mind though during that well, time? Well, first I thought, oh, that'd be good because we'd maybe find out some things and then you sort of feel a bit disappointed because you don't... So your hopes get raised you do, momentarily. All the time, every time something like this comes up, I wonder where they are. And, yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's just horrible. Yeah, and Stephanie, you've talked about, you know, looking, seeing people that might walk the same way or... Mm. Yeah, I followed people, actually. You'd just get caught up in um, that moment of... Is that um, him? Yeah, and I've run off after someone because I'm, you know, convinced that that was definitely him and the closer you get, your heart just sinks. Razik, you dream? You have dreams? Yes. Yeah, I dreamed that he was uh, crawling under the table and he, wants, he wanted to reach me, but he couldn't. And then I said, please stay with us. We can't leave, you know, we are not happy. Just come back, uh, come back, stay with us. And then uh, after that, I just got up and uh, I start crying. Are there things that help in a situation like this? I find I focus on um, the happy things of, to do with Chantelle and Leela, the, the, the fun things we used to do and she, Leela loved to dance around and things like that. So that's, I focus on that. Mm. And do you think that, is that something that's come with time, Kath, yes. given that it's 10 years for you and it's a much shorter time for everybody else? Yes, it has, in, in time. I mean, I wasn't coping at all, but now I seem to cope a little bit better, even though it's getting harder. Um, but, yeah, I just keep thinking of all the funny things she used to say and do and the jokes and mm. all the things like that. You live on the fence, so you sit there, and you know that it can go this way or it can go that way. Once the phone call came, it just went splat, and so did we. <laughs> Good evening, Darren Mara with an SBS World News Update. The UN Security Council passes its toughest ever sanctions against North Korea, but the US had been pushing for more. The opposition accuses the Prime Minister of bullying power company AGL as MPs trade insults. And an elderly pilot's great escape, somehow surviving this. And I'll have a full SBS World News bulletin at 10pm. Dateline. Yes. I advise Australians to vote for it. Or no. Australia don't vote for it. It's again gone. How has Ireland changed since voting for same-sex marriage? Dateline next on SBS. Chris Tarrant explores some of the world's oldest and most spectacular railways. Ah, oh, that's really a hawk. 
extreme luxury. That really is a bit of old railway history. Tarrant on the tracks, tomorrow 7.30 on SBS and On Demand. Being a kid is about dreaming big, which is why MTA finds and creates world-leading teaching resources to help unlock the potential of little dreamers everywhere. Get amazing deals during Hyundai's iSale, including a $1,000 gift card on selected models. The Hyundai iSale starts this Thursday. At Elders Insurance, we know that businesses come in all shapes and sizes, which is why our cover does too. Let one of our local agents find the right insurance for you. Call for a quote today. I used to walk to work. These days I normally just drive. I'm a bloke, so I normally go for the large. I normally have a few of these to keep me going. Since having the kids, I don't normally get time to exercise. Sean, that handful of belly fat is the first sign of toxic fat around your organs. It can cause heart disease and cancer. Your test results don't look normal. The Toro Spring Catalogue sale is on now with great mower offers like this recycler mower at just $795, this time cutter ride on for $4,495, and the 54 inch time cutter HD with My Ride suspension system for under ten grand. See your local Toro dealer today. Right now at Bridgestone Select, when you buy three Firestone tyres for your passenger vehicle, SUV or light van, we'll make your fourth tyre appear for free. For tyres and auto service you can count on, you're always in safe hands at your local Bridgestone Select. Ever noticed how when you return from one adventure, you start planning the next? And when you get back from it, you plan the one after that? It's a wonderful endless loop. But what if you could cut the time between landing and takeoff? With a $400 travel credit each year, now you can. So the only question left is, where next? Get going sooner with 100,000 bonus points with the American Express Explorer credit card. American Express. Realise the potential. I want to create your holiday as if it were my own. Book now with $1 deposits on selected cruises. Seven night Pacific Islands cruise departing Brisbane from $799. Includes bonus on board credit and more. Escape travel, tailor-made. What is money? Why do we cut this? He's dead. This wasn't an accident. Riviera starts Wednesday, 4th of October on SBS and On Demand. Lucas, your 16-year-old sister Colleen went missing in Bowerville 27 years ago. Yes. You were eight years old when that happened? Right. Do you remember how you reacted when, when you realised she was lost. missing? And I felt, because she was the second eldest, and her and my eldest sister, I have four sisters and one brother. My brother had spina bifida, so he's in a wheelchair. My mum was spending most of the time with him, and Colleen and my older sister were like second mothers because they would help us out with us youngest. And um, it just felt so... Like, it was a shock, really, because we were living in Sawtell on the mid-north coast near Coffs Harbour, and she went missing from Barrowville, was where my mother's from. Mum and Dad picked us up from Sawtell and moved to Barrowville immediately, days after, and we were searching in bushland. My mother was knocking on people's doors because the police weren't doing anything, so she decided that she had to do it because nobody else was listening. My mother actually went to the police station and told them that, their daughter, that her daughter was missing. And they just said, uh, because we were of Aboriginal appearance, said to my mum that she's probably going to walk about. So how long was it before the police got involved properly? Uh, well, it's actually... Um, it was three months until they actually took a statement from my mum because she did go back the next day and she actually showed him a photo of my sister <coughs> and she's got much fairer skin than myself. And then they questioned my mum again and said, is that your daughter? Because she's got fair skin, she doesn't look like you. So then she felt let down again also mm. because the, the police are there to put in place 
to help you in situations like this and she felt like she wasn't being heard. And you've, you went on to experience depression and anxiety growing up? Growing up, definitely, because we've had 27 years of living a nightmare, basically, not having answers. But the bigger picture to this is that there were three kids that went missing in the space of three, three months, basically. The other two kids were found murdered. My sister's clothes were found way down in a river, not far from where the other two were found. So no, we know that she's not alive and that she, that, that she is the, a part of all of this. Um, but, you know, um, it's just, it's crazy. You can't comprehend, you can't put into words the emotions that you feel and struggle every day today. Mm, and her body has never been found. Never been found. Um, so mm. that's, we, we know that she's not coming home because her clothes were found. Um, what are you hoping for now? We want someone to be accountable for this. And, you know, having, we've had the police c a commissioner come to our community and a formally apologise to the community of their wrongdoing from the beginning because they didn't take it seriously. Um, that's nothing compared to not having someone, you know. I so have, you want someone brought to justice? Yeah. For the killing, because and you believe the three killings exactly, are Exactly, because someone is walking out there living a life while my sister's missing. How has the fact that her body hasn't been found affected your family, do you think? Immensely. It's indescribable how you feel to have, not have a home. Being of Aboriginal descent, you have that kingship between your community and families and it's not just your immediate family that is mourning. They're all grieving with you together as one and, and it's... it's so finding hard. her body would be very important to you? Yes, we want to bring her home mm. so we can have somewhere where we can go to, you know, like... Um, sorry, I forgot your name. But Steph. Steph. We, <coughs> we actually didn't build a memorial till two years ago so it took us that long to even have a memorial for her. You know, they do have a memorial for the three kids together. But as a family, we, we put one close to our home where we used to go swimming at the river and fishing because that's somewhere where we grow up and that's where she took us and to go do things. So, you know, it took us 25 years to have a memorial. We still don't think that that's... Um, enough. Enough, mm. yeah. Mm. Sharon, your son Owen went missing in Canada when he was 24. Mm. How long have you been waiting to find out what happened to him? Seven years. And what was Owen doing when he disappeared in Canada? Um, the four children went over to Canada in the January of 2010 and um, because of the ski fields they went over and they decided to do 12 months over in Canada. Um, and work and a working holiday um, and then Owen went missing in the August. He, uh, now he'd been to a music festival? Yeah, they, they finished their season, their snow season and he decided to go to a music festival before he came home. And he took some mushrooms? Some yes, apparently the that's festival? what we were told. We, we really have no idea what really happened at that time. Like, yes, he told the doctor when he went to the hospital that he had had mushrooms and had had a bad experience with that. But he had been assaulted a couple of nights before he went to the hospital. Um, and so he had he head injuries. And he left the hospital without his belongings then? Yes. And you and your husband, Steve, went over there. How long did you spend searching for Owen? Uh, nearly nine months, eight or nine months. It was our full-time job. We just went there and searched and looked and flyers and, yeah, mm. media, everything. Now, just last month, mm. you received a phone call from Canada, yeah. which you recorded, and you very generously shared that recording with us. Let's listen to part of that call. The search was conducted on June the 10th in an area about 3.0 kilometres from the hospital where uh, Owen is last known to be seen. Within a matter of an hour, one of the search and rescue members found a shoe, and that shoe led us to uh, tighten down our search, and from that shoe, we were able to locate human 
actually remains. A further search on June 21st with approximately 20 volunteers in that specific area, of course, uh, revealed uh, one bone, which was a toe bone. So we are very confident that we have all the remains that we're going to find in that area. It's at the bottom of a probably 140-foot sheer rock cliff, which uh, is only three kilometers from the hospital. It was just a systematic search pattern uh, of areas, and, and that just happened to be the area we decided to search on June the 10th, and that's what has led us to this phone call today. Any other questions? We'll just digest what, what you've told us now. Thank you for, for the call. Sharon, you sounded so composed as you were being given mm. that information in that call. What, what, what was it like to get a phone call like that? Um, we had or we had prepared for it because they ended up contacting Bree, and and so they told Bree that they were sure that this was Owen, and we went, well, how do you know? Bree got the call first. Mm. Yeah, I got the and call. And you're his sister. Yeah, I, I questioned straight away because obviously we'd had a lot of information and sightings and different things over the years that, you know, you're not going to take something seriously straight away mm, without you've got the evidence. Without yeah. evidence. Did you want it to be him? Um, <laughs> no, because mm. yeah, I I don't want him to be dead, but. As a family, we did want resolution. After seven years, you, you do get to a point where, you, like for me personally, I, was, I, I didn't want to live like this anymore. Mm. But at um, the same time, but at the same you time, don't there, was, want... there was no win-win no in, like, no in this situation. What has it been like for you as a family processing that information you've only just received recently, um, that his remains were found? So we were sort of, we've been living for seven years in this situation where we are, and this is how I, I suppose I've come to the place where I can compose myself, is you live on the fence for seven years, right? It becomes, that's where you sit with that, you know, sort of that information that I don't know. So you sit there and you know that it can go this way or it can go that way. Once the phone call came, it just went splat, and so did we. <laughs> like, you know, we just went and, and we got really, really... It was really quite bizarre to be in that situation where now we know and we feel worse, you know? Sort you of. feel worse knowing. We, we were, like, in time, I imagine, you know, sort of... We haven't even got him back yet. Like, you know, sort of, he's not even here yet. It's taken that long um, to, to be able to get him back and to be able to do what you're talking about, like a, a, a welcome home, you know, sort of like to have him home. What about for the rest of the family? What were your reactions? Um, it was heartbreaking, really. But I know, like, I understand being on the other side of it and just wanting that resolution in any form that it comes. And in some instances, like, it, it is better knowing, but it's still absolutely heartbreaking. Like, I never really let myself think that he had passed over because I didn't have any solid evidence. Um, so I knew it was definitely a possibility, but I didn't ever quite go there and mum was referring to that whole sitting on the fence thing mm. whereas I think Sean kind of accepted that maybe earlier on. Is that right Sean? A few years ago you sort of start to decide whether you're going to accept that he's not coming home or you're going to hold on to that hope that he will come back one day and it, it is a hard decision to make but you've got to do that in yourself one way or the other. Do you know what happened to Owen? No. Still not no, any evidence around no, that. Do you I, think you'll ever know? So we've got just got bones, you know, sort of. And so there's no, 
no investigation, there'll be no, you know, sort of looking into, there'll be no investigation into the assault that, the assault that happened two days before, there'll be no investigation to the hospital giving um, drugs to him with a head condition, there'll be no investigation into, it, it's just we get, like, him seven years later, a partial, um, partial body and that's it, you know, sort of just bones. Like they won't, they can't do anything with that information. As, there can be no, hey? as far as the police are concerned, they've done a good job and they've found him. Yeah, pretty much. Mm. Mm. And so for us, people often say, you know, oh, you've got, we've got closure. Mm. Um, and for us, it's part of our answers. We have part of our answers, but we still, uh, we will still probably live with not knowing what happened, not knowing how he died, not knowing so many so many of our questions mm. and how have you lived with not knowing in all the years in terms of just you know people talk about what ifs and all that kind of thing I mean how have you dealt with those sorts of things um, there are no what ifs there are no um, this could have been or that could have been it just what it is mm. if I look too far into the future or too far into the past then I would go into that space where it's it's hard to live in. Mm. Kath, it's been more than 10 years yes. for you. There is an inquest coming up in December. What are you hoping will come out of that? Well, I'm hoping that um, maybe some witness will get up and say something that they know, because we have this feeling that someone knows something. Um, perhaps the friends that... Came that to, night. Yeah. Mm. Um, and we'll find that out and we'll get somewhere, some lead to perhaps find something yeah, because after 10 years and you haven't got a lead to anything, it's hard to deal with. Mm. And Sassoon, what are you hoping for now? Basically the same, basically some concrete answers. Um, just something concrete so we can deal with it as a family and move on with our lives. I just am waiting for him to come home. I'm waiting for my son to come home. I'm, I just, um, and I'm thinking one evening with, when it's dark, he's going to knock the door and come home. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. I know this hasn't been easy at all. It's very, uh, very generous of you. So thank you. And that is all we have time for here, but let's keep talking on Twitter and on Facebook. Do you feel like you've bounced back or you're getting there? Did I bounce back? Yes, I had to. I felt like I'd failed my family badly. We actually sat together on the gutter and all cried together. I was also living at home at the time, so I put on my suit and just like, I just pretended to keep working for six months. We should actually be celebrating failure. We'll be back next week. Stay tuned.